Welcome to the Dirt Environmental Business Breakdown. Before we get started, I want to remind all participants, the purpose of this presentation is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be construed as a recommendation to purchase or sell any security. Microcap Club is not a registered investment advisor. Microcap Club, its partners, members, subscriber, and affiliates may or may not hold positions in one or more of the securities mentioned on this program and may trade in such securities at any time. Do your own due diligence and seek counsel from a registered investment advisor before trading in any security. I want to thank the Microcap Club community for tuning into this Business Breakdowns conversation with Benjamin Urban, CEO of Dirt Environmental Solutions. My tag team partner for this Business Breakdowns is Jeff Kowal. Jeff is a private investor with a long history in public markets and has been a Microcap Club member since 2016. If you're interested in learning more about Jeff, we will put a link in the show notes to his work. Jeff, it's an honor to have you on this business breakdowns. Welcome. You may be on mute, but uh, welcome. Thanks, Adam. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you. The business we're breaking down today, as mentioned, is Dirt Environmental Solutions, which trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol DRT and over the counter in the U.S. under the symbol DRTTF. Dirt was originally profiled in 2021 by Barracuba. Dirt Environmental Solutions is a global leader in industrialized construction for interior spaces. By utilizing their first of its kind software called ICE, the company custom manufactures clients' unique visions into compelling high performance spaces. This ICE software allows configuration and pricing with direct connection to manufacturing equipment. Dirt has built sustainable workspaces for 30% of the Fortune 500, and the company's motto is not just built for today, building for tomorrow. Over the past few years, led by two U.S.-based hedge funds, a complete restructuring took place, including the management team, the board, and the balance sheet. Now these efforts are starting to show in terms of record delivery times and profitability. Benjamin, thank you very much for joining to us today. Thanks, Adam. Before we get into the presentation, uh, ben, Benjamin, your background is really interesting and actually seems like a great fit from where you were previously, where you were previously to leading this company today. Can you just talk a little bit about that and how the transition has been for you so far? Yeah, Adam. So my, my background, uh, so I actually come from somewhat of an internal hire, if you will, and then I come from the dirt ecosystem. Uh, I ran our largest distribution partner out of Texas for approximately 15 years. And that was really critical in what DIRT was looking for as we transitioned into this new phase or chapter, if you will, from a leadership perspective, was finding somebody that had a background and understanding of what we do um, at an operations and a, a installation level that we didn't have previously. Before I came to DIRT, my background is in international business development, uh, as well as construction, uh, both commercial and uh, residential, but primarily commercial, as well as some um, gaming and uh, as well as on the manufacturing side with Johnson & Johnson. So kind of pairing that background with my experience at the distribution partner level. And for, for those of you that aren't familiar, DIRT's predominant go-to-market method over the last years prior to me coming on board was very much distributor channel, but not in the or uh, say classical sense of that in the DIRT's construction partners or distribution partners, we've called them many things over the years, do multiple things. They are not only distributors of the product, but they're also specifiers, procurers, and installing it. So traditionally, if you had a construction product and you had a distributor, they would be selling it to a subcontractor who would then be taking it and selling it to a general contractor and installing it. Excellent. That's great. Well, yeah, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say about yourself and the business. So this seems like a great time to get into the presentation. Uh, as a reminder to the audience, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and entering your questions there, which we will get to after the presentation. Benjamin, the floor is yours. So... Adam gave a great introduction to who we are um, at a high level um, and what we do. I'm actually flipping through an IR deck that we posted uh, in April that is very intentionally about how we got to where we are now, um, such that we could create a space and time where we can then transition into where we're going. And that, that'll be more information that you hear from us today as, as Jeff does the interview and we dig in a little bit deeper. But this is a great 
just representation, this slide, for those of you that are unfamiliar, when we talk about dirt and we are off-site, pre-manufactured, multi-trade construction, which is a mouthful, um, it's essentially anything in a building, in any vertical that can be healthcare, education, commercial, government, uh, aviation, life science, you name it. Um, anywhere you would have construction, we have an addressable market there that we um, we service. But it's essentially anything between the floor and the ceiling of a space, um, including structural elements as well. So this is a great exploded view of essentially all the solutions that we provide. Um, the thing that's unique about it, though, is everything that you see here that we do is all custom in nature. Um, however, at standard prices and delivery time. So our standard lead time is 10 days for anything that we manufacture. And as Adam mentioned at the beginning, intro there, it is all technology enabled. So we'll chat a little bit about our software technology as well and how that is in service to what we do. So, and this, as I said, this deck's available to all of you. If, if you haven't seen it on our website, feel free to search it out. Um, but I'm gonna go through it uh, somewhat deliberately. So <clears throat> the timeline of where we got to where we are, um, in January of 2022, um, our previous CEO departed, uh, and therein also there was a entire board changeover with a proxy battle uh, in April of 2022, and therein was a full reset, if you will. So I came in in July, August of 2022, and that was with an entirely new board, um, and at that point, just myself. And then we onboarded a new chief operating officer as well as a new CFO. And, and I look at that August 2022 as kind of that point in time where we transitioned to a different approach at DIRT. And we had significant work ahead of us in fixing not just the balance sheet, but pretty much all aspects of DIRT needed some attention. And so what you'll see in this deck is what the financial results are of all the changes that we made and how long that took us to get to where we are today. And so I'm going to go through all of these. Um, you can read them on your own. Um, but essentially, it allowed us to get to a point where we are now, where we've now had five quarters of uh, sequential po uh, positive EBITDA. And really what that was done or how it was done, if you will, is, as Adam mentioned in my background and coming from DIRT, my understanding of who we are and what we do is profound in that it allowed us to move quickly. And in that, the one thing that I didn't comment on, that it wasn't necessarily previous management, but COVID happened as well prior to me coming on board, which was a significant uh, detriment to DIRT. And so at that point when we came on board, uh, we were essentially burning cash significantly and needed to restructure. And so through different areas of the business and cost cutting, we were able to reposition dirt to a point of obviously where we got to profitability. Um, but with that, and I think you can see here, it's a really good example of what happened. And you can see right where um, COVID happened in the middle. But when the previous leadership came on in 2018, we were pretty much at our high water mark of 275 million. And then that began to decline. <clears throat> and then COVID happened, declined further, 2021. And that's where the uh, proxy battle happened. And then they transitioned to new leadership. And so we've gone from where we are currently, it's actually higher in uh, gross profit margin now than we were in 2018. Uh, to where we are in 2024, but you can see we did pretty much a nosedive in 2020 and 2021. And, and part of the underlying reason for that is not just did uh, our material costs increase, but DIRT had had a history of we don't, uh, we don't have price increases. And so as commodity prices rose, in addition to uh, demand decreasing, uh, leadership didn't pivot. And, and therein was kind of what we were handed when we came on board in that the dysfunctional way that DIRT had approached how we handle price increases and uh, commodities was when we had new innovation or new products, 
Dirt would essentially overprice that to balance where we were deficient in margin in other parts of the business. And so it was not a, a healthy way of approaching it. And so what we did is we stopped doing that. We actually had uh, three rounds of price increases to try and get back to a balance where we were uh, profitable and back to margins north of 35%. And in doing so, that created the foundation for where we are today in that through better tracking of those costs and efficiencies, it's positioned us such that we have the ability, if we need to, that we can rapidly deploy price increases if required or continue to monitor it. And say so we have we actually have an internal algorithm that we created specifically around cost tracking and commodities. And that's typically within one to two percent of accuracy, such that we have six to twelve months of runway to know if we're going to need to do a price increase or not. And we've also communicated that all the way through our distributors such that they're prepared for it should we need to do a price increase. Um, we haven't had to um, in the last 18 months. And if we need to, uh, we would actually put that out and, uh, and disclose it ahead of time. So this is a great slide on our, oops, sorry about that. Our journey to excellence in where we've come from 2021. You can see that we're continuing to see uh, revenue increase, our gross profits are increasing, our cash flow is increasing. Uh, we've brought down a significant amount of our overall debt. And so the next question is, where do we go from here? And I'm gonna skip over through some of this just because it's somewhat readable on your own. Uh, here we go. So again, this was from April of this year, showing our forward 12 month pipeline, as well as our revenue forecasting accuracy. So the pipeline continues to grow and you'll see this in our next quarter earnings release that we put out in uh, November. And we actually just in our previous uh, earnings release put out guidance. And this is important that you guys take notice of not just what our 12 month pipeline is, but we'll also disclose what our, our full pipeline is, meaning 12, 24, 36 months out. And why that's important is our typical sales cycle for construction is usually at a minimum of around 12 months. Um, and so what you're seeing here from um, our projections and pipeline, that is actually 90% accurate in what we know is coming and that the pipeline itself, we don't include what we would call leads. And so this is known work that's either as a verbal award to it, it could be under contract. Um, but the point being is that revenue forecasting accuracy you see on the far right, where we went from you know less than 80% accuracy in Q1 of 2023 to 97% accuracy or 99 by the end of the year, that is showing a higher level of integrity in what our overall forecasting is that we lacked before. And, and part of the way we, we were able to do that is identifying milestones with all projects that allow us that greater uh, confidence in whether it's going to do, uh, happen or not, that project through Salesforce. And that's what allowed us to get to that. And so measuring the things that matter as far as forecasting, such that this then trickles through the rest of the organization with operations as well, right, in that we have a much better ability to procure materials, schedule labor, and that's where you're starting to see that journey of zero deficiencies, 100% on time and full, um, and where we went from 84% on time and full to 97, 98%, I think in last uh, quarter we were north of 99. And so, the piece that I'd like you guys to take note of outside of the improvements we've made here is that this is also all at 50% capacity. So running at 99% on time in full and also having the, had the ability last year to stress test, um, October tends to be one of our busiest months um, from an order entry perspective. And so last October, um, we did 20 million that month and saw zero effect to our efficiencies are on time and full. So it it gave us a, a view of a further out 
and you guys can look at the guidance that we we put out and how that layers in as far as a capacity perspective. But essentially, that proves out that at a 240 million, um, there isn't a lot required other than some additional labor, a bit of o overtime. Um, but you can also see the the fixed cost leverage that happened in that month of October and how we can see that now as we project further out uh, through 2024, 2025 and beyond. So in, in summary, I think that it's it's key that you note highest revenue we've had in Q4 of last year. Again, this was put out in April since 2019, highest gross margins, highest EBITDA. Um, our liquidity continues to improve as we continue to take down outstanding debt. Um, really, again, somewhat rearward, rearward facing. Um, shifting or transitioning to where we're going, and Jeff, I'll keep talking unless you want to transition to an uh, energy process. You want me to talk about how we're going to grow? Yeah, so that's been the question is what's different, right? In, in how DIRT's approaching. Some of you have been aware of us or tracked us for the last 20 years. And DIRT was very much settled on a one delivery method or, or channel uh, approach through our distribution partners or construction partners. And so since I've come on board, um, really the first year was uh, restructuring. And the last kind of, I'd say eight months, um, has been around how do we diversify those cha sales channels. So there's really three things that are happening. We're seeing growth through diversification of our sales channels. We are expanding our distribution and construction partners through um, our traditional go-to-market method, if you will. And then I'd say the third is through innovation um, in the solutions that we're delivering. None of this actually touches on the technology component, which I'll talk about the ICE software in just a moment. But what it's allowed us to do is participate in areas where DIRT never participated in before. And in large part, part of that was due to cost. Some of it was accessibility as well. Um, but through what we are spun up called integrated solutions internally to DIRT, it wasn't that DIRT didn't have an appetite to find other ways to approach the market. It's that we didn't have the resources internally to do it intentionally create it. And so if we pursued a general contractor or a building landlord or owner, uh, a collaboration with an architect or designer or other, um, we then relied upon our traditional construction partners and distribution partners to deliver those solutions. And therein was the challenge in that uh, we typically were a higher cost than conventional construction. Many times we could have been on par, and that's part of the reason you see the growth that we've seen in healthcare. The more complicated and uh, higher uh, a quantity of material required for a project that might be in healthcare or other, we tend to be on par from a cost perspective. Sometimes we can be less. In a commercial interior environment, we are typically a premium. And so what this has allowed us to do is pursue work that our partners would not pursue um, through these integrated solutions accounts, such that we're less expensive than conventional construction consistently. And therein is that inflection point of many of these general contractors and building owners are familiar with DIRT, they've used DIRT, um, but they couldn't bring themselves to get around, let's say, a, a 5% delta. So we're not talking huge percentages here either. Um, but at a 5%, it simply wasn't compelling enough to use DIRT for all the value that comes along with it. In this new approach, and I'll use an example, um, we're actually doing all of the uh, bathroom remodels of all things in the DFW airport. And there weren't any drawings, nothing was uh, available to price off of other than a generic cost per square foot basis. And in partnering with the general contractor and the architect, and then us as the solution for construction, therein was the success in that, okay, you're less expensive than conventional construction, and you have all these other value adds of why you would use dirt, whether it's speed, whether it's sustainability, performance, aesthetic, um, in this case, cost, all of those layered into awarding us that project. Where we'll see growth as we look forward with DIRT 
um, through these different channels. Uh, our traditional go-to-market method is very much still the uh, the bulk of our pipeline. Um, and when you'll see it start to layer in where these diversified approaches continue to increase in our pipeline. But then we also are seeing our traditional partners grow as well in areas where we're either underrepresented um, across North America or uh, we may have an under, underperforming partner that we are uh, helping improve or will replace if necessary. So as you layer in these different approaches, also say strategic partnerships is a third of that diversification approach in how we partner with other manufacturers to use dirt solutions within their uh, solutions that they're delivering. All of those different things will then allow us to get significantly beyond where we were. So we talked about that high water mark of 275 million. And so we know we can get to 275, 300 if we didn't do anything differently. So what if we do these additional approaches to uh, address the market and tap into uh, market availability that we didn't have before? And we're starting to see some of that show through in our pipeline. Like I'd said, many of these, it doesn't necessarily matter how you're going to market. Because it is construction, they tend to have a longer uh, lead cycle. The one thing that is different about this approach through um, general contractors is that their work is typically already won, right? So they have a significant backlog. So the desire to tap into that backlog and convert drywall projects into dirt projects allows us to accelerate that timeline of what a typical sales cycle is. And so we're starting to see some of that show up in our pipeline. And we've now developed the teams internally to support that additional growth such that we can service it um, as it comes to us. So I think that's where you'll start to see some things that are different. We've we've telegraphed it a bit in each of our earnings releases um, as we've added these different solutions within DIRT. Um, and I think you'll start to see us provide a little bit more focus on what does that actually mean. All right, excellent. So... I'd love to do some Q&A. Um, for those who don't know, Jeff and Benjamin are actually in the same room, so it will be easy to have Jeff uh, lead some q and I, I would like to start off by asking one question, and then I'll turn it over to Jeff. So, Benjamin, you mentioned doing things that your competitors are not doing in addition to the price function of you versus traditional construction. Can you yeah. just talk a little bit more about that? You know, who, who does the value prop accrue to? Uh, maybe who's making the buying decision. I'd love to just get a little more color on what you mentioned there. Yeah, for sure, Adam. Um, so there's a, a portion of the addressable market that are our customers that represent, in fact, some of you on this call today may actually be sitting in dirt and not even know it. <laughs> um, you know, 30% of the Fortune um, 500 are dirt customers. And therein is the the value proposition where they're using dirt because they either are reconfiguring frequently, um, they're purchasing because they're not sure of what their business growth is going to be. And so they need the ability to de-risk that such that they have the ability to scale if they need to make changes. Um, some are purely there for aesthetic or performance reasons. Um, and so that group of customers that we have, be it the Googles, others of the world that are heavy dirt users, they are willing to pay that premium for all the value proposition that comes with dirt. The, I'll call it class B building in, you know, a smaller MSA that would normally be drywall, PLAM doors, um, we'll say lower in design. Those are usually not your dirt customers. Those are the ones that we want to become dirt customers. You know, as our vision is transforming how the world builds. And so we're not going to get there through the typical dirt customer, um, which we still see growth in. So even with the headwinds that the commercial interior is seeing in the U.S., we're still seeing those traditional dirt customers. Uh, we're continuing to see growth with those within the commercial vertical. Um, even though the rest of the commercial space is seeing contraction and headwinds with regards to real estate. The, those customers will remain dirt customers and they'll continue to be. And through our traditional partners, you'll still see growth there as we layer in more of them in areas where we may have 
uh, either no representation or underperformance with representation. Um, beyond that, where we're trying to get to is that group of customers that would not choose dirt because either the A, they couldn't afford it or B, they didn't know about it. And that's where these integrated partners are coming in. I'll use one with Integrity Built out of Oklahoma. It's a great example of they are a offsite uh, pre-manufactured um, bathroom pod, kitchen pod. Um, I'd say more focused on the uh, hotel industry and service, but they also do some healthcare. They're keen and they're using dirt instead of drywall for their own pods that they're manufacturing, but they're also a drywall subcontractor that does work across the U.S. And they utilize, obviously, in not obvious, but Oklahoma has one of the lowest labor rates in the nation for um, for drywall labor. And they're able to convert their own backlog of drywall to dirt because it's less expensive than drywall for them. And so it allows them to take this solution to their customers that has a higher value proposition, not even beginning to talk about the sustainability piece of it, um, that would normally either A, not know about it, or B, not, uh, not be willing to pay a premium for it. So it solves for that challenge of how do we increase the addressable market to these other customers that, and coming from where I came from being a distribution partner, we would never even pursue that work, right? So there's this entire sector of con the construction industry that has been inaccessible to dirt, and this now allows us to access that market. Excellent. Yeah, thanks a lot for that color. Um, I will now turn it over to Jeff, and I can pop back in with some questions from myself and the audience. So Jeff, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Uh -huh, appreciate it. Um, so I prepared a few questions here and uh, I'll, I'll fire away. I um, I think it's important to, to note how I met Benjamin. It was uh, probably four or five months ago uh, back in Toronto. He was giving a brief pe presentation at the Mars uh, Discovery District. It's kind of a uh, uh, an incubator uh, type of forum there. And um, the topic was on environmentally sustainable business practices. And he gave a great, a great presentation and, and he used an example of a current client uh, in ConocoPhillips. And so I'm going to tax his memory just a little bit here. Um, there were two things that really stood out to me uh, with his presentation in regards to this client. Um, the first thing was the amount of landfill that's, that Dirt's solution um, avoids versus traditional construction. And he ran through some some numbers, and I think it would be helpful for um, the, the listeners here to get an idea of um, what their solution does for, for all their clients in, in avoiding unnecessary landfill. And then the second part um, that I'd like him to talk about briefly is um, just how much clients actually re-image their space. And I don't remember the exact numbers that you use for ConocoPhillips, but it but it really floored me in in how often people can use your, I'll call it a Lego-like yeah. so yeah. solution um, to uh, to change up their space and why that's important. For, for sure. sure. Um, I'm just going to leave mine off. We'll use your volume or turn it off altogether. Um, no, so it's a, it's a great... Great segue there, Jeff. So talking about, uh, and we'll use the ConocoPhillips, it's a, it is a great example of how our customers use dirt. And at its core, what the thing that dirt does is it, it de-risks construction at every single turn of when you're building. And even after you've actually uh, occupied the space. And it allows you to decrease schedule. It allows you to increase speed. Um, it, it essentially eliminates uh, chargebacks or uh, change orders from a contingency perspective. And the reason it does that is because of that software. And, and the technology is key to all of these things because it enables us to do the reconfigures that, that Jeff was just did, talking about. And that because it is all automated through that technology and which is also the same platform that we sell to Armstrong World Industries and about a half a dozen other manufacturers that are on our ICE platform. 
um, that we are continuing to expand that as well. So that's its own, honestly, separate conversation. Um, but from how a user can actually leverage dirt, and yes, we have a sustainability story in how we even manufacture um, in the materials we use, the amount of waste or that we divert in how we manufacture. But I think that many times what's lost is in a environmental conversation is so focused on the energy component of it and the materials go into it that the story around a circular economy, right? And how do you ensure that that product gets reused and doesn't end up in a landfill? And so that, that ConocoPhillips case study is so interesting in two reasons. One, I like it because it's actually just before COVID, um, even though it has ramifications and how it could solve for COVID related uncertainty. So the just kind of brief, uh, conversation around what that project was. So it's a million square feet, uh, two towers in Houston, Texas. They were exiting a campus that was built in the 80s uh, into something more modern that was vertical in nature. And as I had said earlier, there's there's customers like ConocoPhillips or Google that are heavy dirt users and that they lean into the product to reimagine and reconfigure their space frequently. So Conoco actually does it on a basically at a minimum monthly basis, if not every weekend. And so when you look at a regular conventional construction project, you have a beginning, you have an occupancy, um, and within that, something may happen, right? And even if it doesn't, you occupy the space. But in reality, like I was saying, a traditional project's at least a year long. By the time you occupy that space, you've already you're already not relevant with where you were 12 months ago. And so what happens is you occupy the space and you live in it for three, five, seven, 10 years, whatever that is, till it gets to a point where something happens and there's an event that's painful enough that all of a sudden you reconfigure, right? And so many of you have experienced this. You either go to a swing space or you you know reconfigure part of the space while you're in it, um, but it's painful and it's expensive. And that's part of the reason why people don't do it. With dirt, you have this ability to reconfigure all the time. And so it allows you to stay relevant and make micro changes. You can also make huge changes as well, right? So once you've occupied the space, you can make changes on a regular basis, which ConocoPhillips does. The thing that's unique about this project is they had to make major changes during construction, which was unexpected. They chose dirt because they knew that they churned a lot. Um, they're also heavy private office users, so it made it more difficult for them if they didn't have dirt to make those changes. So they're typically 80 to 90 private offices per floor. And so during construction, we were half, I'm going to step back a, a little bit further as well. Um, that project had, a, as many of that size do, had a steering committee. And the steering committee said, hey, we want to see what, what our space is going to look like. So here's the challenge. First sub trades on site, there's nothing to measure off of. Um, they had just topped off the building. And the kicker to it was that the, and this is in 20, 2016. So brand new building, ground up construction, and there was an engineering failure and they had undersized the mat. So the building was sinking. So the challenge was on the floor that they wanted to do this mock-up on level four, the building sunk five inches from the building envelope to the building core. So in 50 feet, there was a five inch drop. So that's where we needed to build this 5,000 square foot mock-up that also had to be reused once they actually occupied the space. So, and whatever that ended up being needed to be interchangeable between two towers. So as you can see, significant challenge in that. So we built the mock-up and tore it down Built this as we were building the space, oil crashed in the middle of it. So we had built 10 floors. There was 10 more floors that were en route to Conoco, either on the factory floor, were either um, in shipping or were in uh, programming to be manufactured. So the question was, what happens if we if we hit pause for 30 days? And so we hit pause for 30 days. The architect then gave us drawings as they were doing them before they even submitted to the city for permit. And we be began restacking this building during construction. 
And so we reconfigured 10 floors that had already been built, took product from those floors, relocated it to upper floors, and then began bringing more material in. The net effect of it was that they lost 30 days of their construction schedule. Um, and it cost roughly $500,000 in labor and materials. So 500,000 of, and if you think about that, it was roughly 40,000 lineal feet of walls per tower. So very minimal cost. If they had built that conventionally, and this is essentially, not essentially, this is exactly what the architect said at the end of the project when they took occupancy. He said, hey, look, you know, with 30 people in this owner's meeting, if we hadn't used dirt, this never would have happened. You would have occupied the space and you would have gone floor by floor over 18 months and you would have torn one down, built it back, torn one down, built it back and you see where this is going. Um, and it would have cost you a minimum of 10, if not 20 fold, what it cost you to do with dirt, just in material alone. Ultimately, they occupy the building, they build another tower. And so they have a million square feet with 80,000 manual feet of walls that are interchangeable between both towers and they move that product rather frequently. To Jeff's comment, that also diverted, not just during the uh, initial construction, but, and so that's to my perspective, one of the most compelling things is that many of our customers use dirt and they don't necessarily use it for uh, an environmental or sustainability rationale. They're using it for a business reason, but they're in getting the benefit of that. And I think that five years ago, that was the case. I think we're in a different time now where companies are being forced to build more sustainably. And it may not even be because um, they're trying to further their own ESG ambitions. It's that this point in time for dirt is unique in that labor shortages continue to increase, material uh, price escalation continues to go up. And all of those lean into our value proposition such that there's users now that five years ago would not have been a dirt um, user, even through our traditional channel that are now. And then from a broader addressable market um, through these integrated solutions that we've brought in-house to dirt, it allows us to access even more of that. So it's it's a unique transition time at dirt. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Benjamin. Um, I've got two quick questions, Adam, and then maybe we'll open up for questions. Does that work for you? Whatever works for you guys is fine. I have some questions uh, uh, myself um, as well. Um, so my first, uh, my second question is, the secret sauce. Um, Benjamin mentioned Armstrong World that you've, I think you've licensed out to them and you mentioned sure. some, some others. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I, I remember reading about $11 million or something to Armstrong. They're, they're a $6 billion company. Um, you guys have been reiterating this, yeah. this ICE software. Like, is this the secret sauce? Why is a $6 billion company interested in, in utilizing the software? Yeah. yeah. So, so it, it very much is our secret sauce, Jeff. The The ICE technology allows us to do things that nobody else can. And the challenge for most manufacturers, and it, it has been somewhat for Armstrong, but they embraced it, is it's hard to unwind that. If you're manufacturing a certain way and then to basically refactor everything you're doing to be technology enabled and automate, um, the, the cost barriers are simply too high. And so for us, what we ended up doing is because Dirt was founded with technology from the beginning. So we had the ICE software before we manufactured a stick of anything, and it took years to create it. And to your point, over the last 20 years, it's continued to iterate and grow and improve and evolve. And so for Armstrong and others, the attraction is that what it enables a company to do, um, and really they're heavy users, not even fully leveraging the automation components or capabilities of what it can do on the manufacturing floor, but even purely from a pricing configuration rendering uh, engine uh, such that they can then use that to influence how they're engineering and how they're manufacturing. So there's certain points in time where the software essentially superpowers what you do. We use it across the board, as do our partners, which is also unique. Many distributors, subcontractors, et cetera, rely upon the manufacturer 
to provide engineering drawings, provide bill of materials, do that lift for them. The software does that. So it automates it either for us or for them. So it allows them on their own to do that component of manufacturing that is typically relied upon by the manufacturer. Therein lies our ability to scale as well. And so for Armstrong and others, and it's interesting, I, I can't I can't say for sure that these two are directly correlated, but if you look at their margin expansion, um, and we've been working with them for six years now, it was only recently that we had the transaction with them that allowed us to socialize um, that their project works software is actually ICE um, that we provide for them. And, and they continue to uh, add as much of their catalog as fast as they possibly can that software technology factors out there that have an appetite for it. The thing is that there isn't anything off the shelf. And I've attended Advancing Prefab, Built Worlds, all these other construction uh, product manufacturers. There is no solution out there. In fact, there's a thousands of different variants that only accomplish a certain piece of that, right? And so all of them would love to have 10-day lead times. But until you have the ability to automate and then be able to scale with the automation, you, you simply can't get there. So you're relying upon an in-house large engineering team to essentially create those drawings of how you're going to build or manufacture this. The software automates all of that. Um, and therein is the opportunity for us as well in that previously through not just previous leadership, but even through previous founders all the way to the beginning, um, there was never a, a deliberate effort put behind commercialization of it. Um, to be honest, some of these with Armstrong and others were um, not necessarily fully intentional, good on dirt, right? Because it's good for us. It's another revenue stream, but um, no real effort put behind selling the actual standalone technology to other manufacturers that are complementary to us as well. And so Within our world, there's other manufacturers, be them structural, mechanical, um, that we work with, on, work with on a regular basis. They very much want this technology, but it's never been pushed towards them or tried to bring them in to become part of this broader platform. Great. Thank you. Uh, my last question is um, pertaining to more of the, the nuts and bolts of the financials. Um, as you've mentioned, we've already seen uh, five sequential EBITDA positive quarters. Uh, you've managed to retire a, a significant amount of the debt on the balance sheet. And if I'm not mistaken, yeah, yeah. the I think your target is to get under one times debt to EBITDA by I think the end of 2025. Um, so you're rapidly on your way to that. Um, you've already mentioned that you can do, you know, several hundred million dollars more without adding any capex to the current facility. Um, you have $150 million thereabouts in tax loss carry forwards between yeah. Canada and the US. Um, there's a lot of cash flow, that future yeah. cash flow that's that's coming down uh the pike. What do you what do you, what are the in in broad terms, what, yeah. do you, what are you planning on doing with all that cash? So, so I'm gonna touch a bit on it from a commercial perspective. Um, and then we'll grab our CFO and she can carry it forward from a finance perspective. Um from a commercial perspective, you know, there's there's a few different things there. One is reinvestment and innovation. Um, you know, we have a very uh, detailed strategic attack for our commercial team on how do we grow. Um, and, and that is, I think one of the questions is, what is the greatest obstacle limiting your growth today that came in from one of the listeners? Um, and really, it is its coverage. Um as it just takes time, right? So a traditional partner that we bring on board, like I was in Texas, a new one takes two years, 12 months just to get somewhat competent, and then another 12 months to actually show something material into our pipeline. Um, a, uh, a partner that's from on our integrated side can be much less simply because that's more transactional in nature. They're we're, we're converting something that already exists, whether it's drywall or some other opportunity to dirt, but we're also carrying some of that cost because we're enabling that to happen. So we're doing that in-house. So it essentially short circuits that two years to make it shorter. But therein is the challenge is how long it takes us to grow is just the types of projects that we work on are, are longer in nature. But 
being able to reinvest that cash from an innovation perspective allows us to accelerate certain things that we may be pursuing from a product development perspective um, that may be on a certain timeline. And that's not just products that are physical in nature. That's also ICE. So on the technology side, right? So we have um, strategic plans for both of those sides of our business and already underway, right? So we've already put investments towards them. So we've begun that growth path. So we're already seeing it start to happen. But if we can accelerate it, so somewhat comp not competing, but complementary values is continue to get the debt down. And then to your point, at that cash uh, flow per kind of inflection point where we have significantly more, how can we accelerate that to go even faster to get this growth to move more quickly? And, and that can be multiple things. You know, there is a, another question about expanding the sales staff. Um, interestingly enough, with as efficient and profitable as we are um, at similar revenue levels that we've been at before, with a significantly small, smaller sales staff. So we, we've accomplished this, not with just layering in more people from a sales perspective. That being said, that doesn't mean that there is an opportunity to grow. And so as we layer in additional direct sales support, so we have direct salespeople in the field, in addition to our distributors who have their own sales force. And then from a business to business perspective with these integrated partners, um, they also have their own internal sales force. But as we grow, and again, it takes time. Um, it's not simply just layer in salespeople and watch it happen. But we will continue to add sales teams. Um, we've also added recently column subject, subject matter experts in certain verticals that are tactical for us, be it healthcare, um, aviation, others, where we see greater opportunity to grow faster. Um, balancing that, though, and the reason I say balance, Jeff, is that lessons from the past, previous leadership, we want to be $500 million, we're going to send out guidance, These are this is how we're going to do it. We didn't get there. We built for something, expecting it to come, and it never came. So this is a much more measured approach to we will build it as we grow versus building it ahead of ourselves. And that's we've spent the last really six months in earnest on some of the support internally for those integrated partners, such that as they give us business, we have the ability to actually perform and deliver it, such that we didn't want to go out and be um, – under-resourced where they said, okay, well, you can't service what I'm giving you, so I'm not going to. So we've been able to navigate that balance of investment growth, investment growth, um, such that we don't get out beyond uh, our capabilities. So to answer your question, some of that will be reinvested um, on both sides of the business. And then um, let me grab Faria real quick and have her comment on the, and we can actually circle back to that at the end um, for, for other, other areas, areas of what, what do you do with, with Excellent. Okay, thank you. How how, uh, how are we doing there for uh, for time, Adam? We probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, okay, I can go. I can go ahead with one, or if you want to wrap it up on something, oh. feel free. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm 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 satisfied on my end. Uh, so I'll I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Adam. Great, thanks. That was great. Um, yeah, one I guess just high level. So you've accomplished a lot as we discussed since you were brought on board and uh, there's a lot of moving parts. I think prioritization is probably a, um, a key thing for you now. So I'd love for me, for you to maybe just talk about the biggest priorities for you in the near term. And then maybe if you want to layer that into kind of your long-term goals for the business uh, and just how you're kind of thinking about where you are in, I don't want to say turnaround, but just in all of your efforts uh, since you were hired. Yeah. So I, I won't say that, um, you know, the turnaround's behind us. I won't say we don't still have additional opportunity and work to do um, across the organization using an innovation as a broader term in that we continue to find efficiencies on the operating and, and operations and manufacturing side, um, you know, from a, a structural component. Um, you know, largely the work's behind us, right? So it is very much forward focused now. The The thing we have that many manufacturers don't beyond the capacity piece is the visibility into our pipeline. So yes, a challenge to growth is how long in duration those 
life cycles are of our projects. However, with that also comes certainty around what's coming, right? Such that when you have a 10 day lead time, you have to be really accurate on what's coming in and when you're going to deliver that. And so it creates this um, positive kind of friction between the two that it allows us to see in, okay, we're very confident on a, you know, what does the next quarter look like? Um, which you can see some of that come through in our guidance and, you know, our guidance will continue to improve as we grow. Um, but, but therein is the opportunity that we know where we're going and we see the growth happening. And so that gives us confidence to make decisions that need to be made more around a commercial perspective. And, and the way I say that is out of all the changes we made, that was actually the last component of the company that we made the final changes in. We needed to fix some things in-house first to service our customers. Um, and we didn't want to disrupt any sort of the commercial pipeline or our sales force or things of that nature. And so it was, um, let's leave that alone until the very end, which we've already made all those changes here. So some of my comments around us being at a low watermark from a sales representation perspective. Um, and then I would say not just at balance with our traditional partners, um, but better partners than we had before. So our regular construction and distribution partners, that is also on parity, but I would say higher performing. And then as we layer in these other teams that I've been talking about or other partners, therein is what we're very focused on is the next um, 12, 18 months <clears throat> is 100% focused on top line growth. And we needed to get those building blocks in place such that we were confident that we could deliver on it. And as we begin to layer in, and we'll, you know, you'll see it in our, our earnings releases moving forward and that it won't be generic as much around we've added this many partners. It'll be a bit more specific on who's coming into our, uh, our ecosystem um, as well as, focus on, and, and this is one thing that's allowed us, Adam, to prioritize, is that as we've gotten a lot of this behind us now, it gives us more bandwidth. Um, you'll notice the promotion of Rich Hunter, who you'll meet here momentarily, who's our chief operating officer. Um, part of that was also to increase capacity for me to be in the field more um, with our commercial team, helping drive that top line growth as well as developing more partnerships. And so we did a, a PR on a, a collaborative project with HKS Architects um, for a, an emergency room solution. You'll see more things of that nature that aren't just a kind of commercialization collaboration, but something very specific that is around solving for a problem with other manufacturers that are typically much larger than we are that we provide something unique to them. The more of those that we can layer in as well with the rest of the diversification diversification that we're doing will then help support that very much laser focused top line growth. Um, how do we continue to add to that? And a, a larger part of it as well is us taking ownership of getting that message out. We've been historically at DIRT very reactive to our partners and relying upon them to get that message out to the world about what we do. And we've taken a much um, greater uh, control of that in making that message ourselves, which therein supports them and helps them with their own businesses, but also ensures our stability and that we have um, access to those markets that we're pursuing. Excellent. That's great. Thank you very much. That seems like a great place to end it. And I just want to say thank you again very much, Jeff and Benjamin, for your participation, the audience as well for attending, and um, really intriguing setup. And um, I think you've left us with a lot of really good information and a, a lot to explore. So thank you again very much for taking the time out of your day to do this. My pleasure, Adam. Do we great. want to hang on for a minute and ask Rich and Faree anything, or do you want to do that individually? Yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and end the webinar here and you guys can do what you'd like to do individually. The recording will be available, or excuse me, we'll post the recording on Microcap Club as soon as it's available. And uh, thank you again to all the participants. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Adam. All right, thanks. Take care.